Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to go through a problem that's been suggested by a viewer. It's a problem that I hadn't come across before, and I thought it was very interesting and surprisingly difficult. So let's start with the statement of the problem. Um, what we have is a ball rolling without slipping across horizontal ground with a constant velocity of v and a radius of r. So the ball is then going to encounter a vertical step up of height h, and we're only going to consider the case where h is smaller than the radius of the ball. Uh, the question is, what is the minimum velocity required in order for the ball to reach the top of the step? So in order to analyze um, this system, I'm going to split the motion of the ball up into two stages. So the first stage is going to be um, sort of the initial collision between the ball and the step. <clears throat> and then we're going to think about what happens subsequently to that uh, later on in the video. So I'm just going to copy this uh, diagram up here. And we're going to think about the initial conditions of the collision between the ball and the step. So I'm going to move the ball over to the right so that it's in this position where it just first comes into contact um, with the step. Because before, up until that point, the dynamical state of the ball is not going to be changing. Um, right, so we know it's moving to the right with a velocity of v. But if it's running without slipping, it must also have some angular velocity about its own center of mass, right? So I'm going to denote that initial angular velocity about its own center of mass um, as lowercase omega, um, like this. So then what we're going to do is make an assumption that the collision is inelastic. In other words, instead of bouncing back where it came from, um, the ball, the point of contact between the ball um, and the step, in other words, this point over here, that point is going to remain fixed, right? So as soon as the ball comes into contact with the step, um, that point is going to be fixed. What that means is that we can describe the motion of the ball after it's come into contact with the wall as a purely rotational motion um, about that point, about that point of contact. So if I just um, change the labels on this diagram, um, what's going on now is that the final sort of condition of the motion um, is it's rotating with some angular velocity, I'm going to call that capital omega, but it's rotating about a different point, right? So I'm just going to put some crosses on these diagrams to highlight that. Initially, the angular velocity, small omega up there, that was a rotation about the center of mass, um, whereas now it's rotating about the point of contact. Okay, so what we want to do is solve for capital omega in terms of the original parameters of the problem so that we know how exactly the ball is moving after this collision. The way we're going to do that is considering conservation of angular momentum. Now, as a quick justification for why you can use conservation of angular momentum, consider for a moment the force that the step is going to exert on the ball. Right. So um, if you look at this diagram over here in the middle, um, the force between the step and the ball is a contact force, so it's going to act normally to the surface of the ball. Right. So the surface of the ball is curved, and so um, really what that means is that the contact force is going to act normally to the tangent plane of the ball. But then we've got this circle theorem that says the angle between a tangent and a radius is 90 degrees, and putting all of that stuff together, um, we conclude that the contact force is going to act along a radius of the ball, and if it's acting along a radius of the ball, then it must be acting through the center. Right, so you could draw that arrow on there. That would be the, the contact um, force between the step and the ball. Um, now, because it's acting through the center of the ball, it's not going to exert any torque on the ball, and therefore the angular momentum is indeed going to be conserved. So we're going to consider conservation of angular momentum about that uh, point of contact. So let's set up an equation uh, expressing the conservation of angular uh, momentum. Okay. So, the thing we have to be careful of is that before the collision, there were really two contributions to the angular momentum. Um, now, there, there is the obvious contribution, which is the moment of inertia, which I'm going to call I multiplied by the angular velocity, small omega. That is the angular momentum due to the spin of the ball about its own center of mass. Okay. But then, if you consider how the center of mass of the ball is moving originally, I'm going to draw a dotted line on this um, diagram at the bottom left. Um, and so that dotted line is showing the path that the center of mass is taking. Because that path is not, it doesn't go through the point of contact, right? 
there is some the ball has some angular momentum about the point of contact um, due just to that translational motion, right? So you've got two contributions, um, the spin about its own axis, but also the fact that it's not moving um, in a line that passes through uh, the, the point of contact. So it's kind of like um, if you wanted to find the total angular momentum of a planet, you would need to add together its orbital angular momentum um, and its angular momentum due to its spin about its own axis. So what actually is the magnitude of that second contribution to the angular momentum? Well, we've got to figure out um, that little distance there, um, which I'm marking on that, that middle diagram. Um, <clears throat> fortunately, because of the geometry, this comes out fairly um, easily. That is just the radius of the ball minus the height of the step, r minus h, which means that the angular momentum due to that motion is going to be, well, the linear momentum, um, which is mass times velocity, um, I'm calling the mass m, multiplied by the perpendicular distance um, to the, the reference point, which we've just figured out is r minus h. So that is the total initial angular momentum. What about afterwards? Well, you might think um, that it's just moment of inertia times um, capital omega, but there's one change that we've got to make. Um, this is where it becomes relevant. Remember I was saying earlier, uh, that it's now rotating about a different point. Now, if it's rotating about a different point, that means we have to use a different moment of inertia. To find the moment of inertia that we have to use, um, we can use the parallel axes theorem, right? So if the, the initial or the, the moment of inertia through the center of mass was I, um, we have to add on, the parallel axes theorem tells us we have to add on um, mr squared um, if we're now rotating about an axis on the circumference um, of, of that circle. Um, and then we can just multiply that by capital omega, the final angular velocity. So, um, so we've now carefully constructed this equation that expresses the conservation of angular momentum. Let's see if we can use that um, to solve for capital omega. <laughs> there are a few other things we can do. Uh, we can substitute, assuming that it is indeed a ball, we can use the standard result that the moment of inertia of a solid sphere uh, or a ball is two-fifths mr squared. Um, we've also got this lowercase omega in here, but using the fact that the ball is not slipping, uh, let me just write that down, so because it's not slipping, um, we can say that the linear velocity uh, originally b is equal to the radius of the ball times its angular velocity. Okay, If that weren't true, then there would be relative motion between um, a, a point on the circumference of the ball um, and the ground, and, and they'll be slipping. Okay, so we've got these these other two equations that we can kind of use with our angular momentum equation. Putting all of that together, um, <clears throat> what do we get? Well, the first term becomes two-fifths m r squared omega. Uh, the second term we can just leave as it is, mv times r minus h. And the right-hand side, well, i was two-fifths m r squared. If we add on one more m r squared, we get seven-fifths of m r squared in total. So seven-fifths mr squared times capital omega. Um, okay, but then we can use this no slip condition to eliminate small omega. Um, if you think about it, we've got r squared omega down here. Um, if r omega equals v, then r squared omega must be equal to uh, v times r, right? So this entire first term is two-fifths of mvr, but then we've got another uh, MVR from that second term. So overall, we've got seven fifths of MVR. So putting all of that together, um, we've got MV. So then that turns into seven fifths R, right? Um, and we still get the minus H from the original second term. And that's equal to seven fifths of MR squared times capital omega. Okay, so conveniently, the mass then cancels from both sides. That's why I didn't define it as one of the initial parameters of the problem. If we rearrange this, we can get an expression for omega, um, and that is going to be uh, just multiplying up by 5 over 7r squared. You get 5v over 7r squared multiplied by that set of brackets, 7 fifths of r minus h. Uh, I think the neatest way to write that is to multiply uh, the 5 over 7r into the brackets, and then it's going to turn into v over r into 1 minus 5 sevenths um, of h over r. Okay, and 
just as a quick check that this does indeed make sense, if we try h equals zero here, the second term in the brackets disappears and you get capital omega equals v over r, which is the same as um, small omega was initially, which is basically saying if there is no step, then nothing happens. So that's all um, consistent with what we expect. Um, okay, so we now know how the ball is going to be moving uh, immediately after it comes into contact with the step. There's just one more step um, now, which is to check whether it has enough energy to make it to the top. So what we're going to do now is consider um, the conservation of energy. So let me just write that down. Well, um, the initial energy that it has, or the energy that it has immediately after the collision, is going to be a half times the moment of inertia times the angular velocity squared, because it's purely rotational, right? Remember that the moment of inertia that we have to use, because it's now rotating about a point on the circumference um, or on the surface of the ball, is not just i, but i plus mr squared, right? And our angular velocity is now capital omega. So this stuff there, that is our rotational kinetic energy just after the collision. Now, in the case where it just makes it over to the top, uh, or just makes it onto the top of the, of the step, um, all of that rotational kinetic energy is going to be converted into gravitational potential energy, and there's going to be no kinetic energy left over, right? So we can set that equal to mgh if we want to find the sort of minimum velocity in order to make it um, over the top of the step, which is indeed exactly what we wanted to find. So then we can substitute in our uh, expression for capital omega, right? So this turns into half, remember from earlier that i was 2 fifths mr squared, so the bracketed term becomes 7 fifths of mr squared. Um, and then, uh, okay, let's leave that as capital omega squared for now. That's supposed to be mgh. So then again, the masses cancel from both sides. Um, we get 7 tenths as our prefactor. <laughs> now we've got r squared capital omega squared, which is like r omega all squared. Now from that expression uh, that we derived just now, we can substitute that as v squared and then 1 minus 5 sevenths um, of h over r all squared. Um, okay, and then that's equal to g times h. Now what we've got to do is rearrange and make v the subject. So after we go through a little bit of algebra, we find that v is equal to um, 1 over uh, 1 minus 5 sevenths h over r times the square root of 10 gh over 7. Now I think this is kind of a nice form to leave it in because you've got this ratio of h to r there, but if you wanted you you could multiply everything up by 7r and come up with a final answer of um, 7r over 7r minus um, 5h times the square root of 10 gh over 7. So there you go, we've derived a minimum velocity required for the ball to make it up the step.